Welcome to Ray's Reflection, a common man's Bible study. Today we're going to continue discussing the discord that uh, uh, Jesus had with the, the Jews concerning being the bread of life. And we're going to begin in John chapter 6. We're going to begin in verse 41. Now, it says in verse 41, The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Now let us discuss where we are. Jesus has come over to the Sea of Galilee. People have followed him. They want a meal ticket. They want more miracles. The miracles that he performed, the feeding of the 5,000 males, did not act, cause them to look at it as if he were God. So he has made some statements to them. He has made some statements that he is the bread that came down from heaven. He made statements that he was the bread of life. And if you came to him, he would give you eternal life. And on the last day, he would raise you up. In other words, the statements that he has made are all statements only God can make. And only God can do. Certainly man can't raise anybody from the dead. Let alone raise them on the last day. Now, <clears throat> because he said that, they murmured. The thing you, you should pick up, <clears throat> a little nuance, is the fact that in verse 41 you see the word Jews. Now you have to remember Jesus was a Jew. But when he says the Jews here, he doesn't include himself. The reason is whenever the word Jew, the Jews is mentioned in the scriptures. It is always mentioned as a negative to the gospel. It's always in opposition to Jesus Christ. And therefore, when, so when you see that, the Jews, he's, he's talking either the ruling body of religious people or the Jews themselves who were unbelieving or opposed to the gospel. And here they, they murmured among themselves because the statements he made were not necessarily hard at this point to understand, but they were statements only God could make. So he, so that brings us to the, the next statement. It says this, And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he said, I came down from heaven? In other words, how is he claiming to be God? In other words, we know his mother and his father, and uh, we can't, they could not put together the fact that he was uh, a di divinity. After all, he was born and raised in, in the same area and doing the same things and educating the same place as they were, and therefore they didn't see a difference and they couldn't understand the difference. Now, <clears throat> Jesus is going to approach them as unbelievers. Now the reason for that is, they should have never made this statement. Why not? Because in the Old Testament, etc., it talks about, there are over 300 prophecies about the, the coming of Jesus Christ, and there are a great deal of prophecies about Him being born, and how He is to be born. And they naturally assumed that Joseph was His father. And Joseph wasn't. God was His father. It was the virgin that... <coughs> became pregnant that was mentioned in the in the Old Testament and they never they never made the connection so consequently they are they are in unbelief and they are willfully in unbelief because they're looking to satisfy themselves so God is going Jesus is going to approach them that way so Jesus said therefore and answered and said unto them murmur not among yourselves you cannot continue to murmur among yourselves then in verse 45 it says it is written in the prophets Excuse me, uh, verse 44 says, No man can come to me except the Father who ha has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up the last day. That is a tremendous statement. Uh, isn't it interesting that it says here, No man can come to, to Jesus unless God the Father draws him. You need to understand this. Uh, I'm going to throw out a, a theological word that is, is used to, for you to understand this in just a minute. In Romans chapter 3, it says, none seeketh after God. In other words, there is not one person who goes looking after God. And immediately you balk at that statement because we think of all the religious people in today's world. 
In fact, in our community, we have religious people who are constantly seeking God. And it's interesting, when they have a religious experience, etc., they will tell you they found God as if God was lost. And he's not. It is mankind who's lost. And Romans chapter 3 says, None seeketh after God. No, not one. Not one. Well, what are they seeking after? They're seeking after their concept of what God is. That the Shintus are doing that. The Buddhists are doing that. The Muslims are doing that. Everyone's doing that. They're not seeking the true God who created the heavens and the earth. And therefore, uh, he says here, then no one can come to God unless he, he draws him. Now, what is that drawing? I'm going to throw out the word and give you this word. It's called <clears throat> prevenient grace. I'll give you an illustration, and I can use myself as an example. Prevenient grace is all the activity of God before you're saved to get you to a position to make that decision. Uh, I'll do this myself. When I was <clears throat> 16 and 17, I was preparing myself to go into the military. Then I would go to Vietnam. This is what I planned on doing. This is what I was going to do. I was going to enlist in the Army. And when I was 17, early in my 17th year, I fell through a barn floor quite a distance, and I broke my hand, and now I remain crippled to this day. That is just an example of God saying, no, you're not going to go that way. I want you over here. So I went to college, and I became a teacher. And the very first day that I <coughs> was teaching, quite a tall man walked into my room and introduced himself. And that tall man became my friend, and he was one of the few born-again believers on the staff of, a, of 105 teachers. And he became my friend, and he witnessed to me for 10 years before I got saved. In other words, God broke my hand to get me to go to college and to meet this individual, and he brought this individual into my life. And eventually I came to a point where I was to make a decision. That's prevenient grace. It's the work of God before you're saved to get you to the point of making that decision. I had a pastor tell me uh, years ago when he explained that to me, he says, well, it's like a man who has a donkey and he's trying to get this donkey to cross the bridge and the donkey won't cross the bridge. He says, so he picks the donkey up, carries the donkey halfway across the bridge, puts the donkey down and then walks across himself and leaves the donkey right there to decide for himself which side he's going to go. Is he going to go back or is he going to go forward? And that's basically prevenient grace. That's exactly what God does. And therefore, what he's telling these people, he's, say, he's saying, no man comes to me unless God draws him. Now, if you're in the crowd and you heard that, would you be drawn to Jesus? And if you weren't going to Jesus, would you be being drawn by God? And this would irritate you, to think that a man would tell you, you're not being drawn by God, because you're not coming to me. And therefore... Uh, we have a, a very difficult position here because Christ is no longer coddling to them. He's no longer coddling them. He's no longer going to hold their hand and say, oh, come. Now he's, he's, he's going to tell them exactly where they stand. This willful disobedience on your part, this will, willful disbelief is going to cost you. And then he comes to verse 45 and he says this, he says, it is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that has heard and has learned of the Father cometh to me. Notice the word, every man that has heard. It's not every man that hears with his ears. It's man that hears with his heart. In other words, he hears the word, and that word affects him. He says, that man will come to me. And, and, he said, and he's looking at them and he's saying, and that is written in the Old Testament. And therefore you are not hearing me. In other words, you're hearing my words, but you're not understanding them you're, because you willfully don't want to understand them. And then he says this in verse 46, he says, Not that any man has seen the Father, except he who is of God, he has seen the Father. And now he's telling them, basically, I have seen the Father. Later on in the scriptures, he will say, I and the Father are one, or are the same. And therefore, uh, they will really, really get upset here. Then he comes to 
uh, verse 47, and he says this, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me has everlasting life. I want you to look at a few things here. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth, that's present tense, who believes on me, hath, that's present tense. And that's something that you, 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 you need to grasp a hold of. Uh, many religions, etc., are getting people prepared to find out where they are going after they die. In other words, are your works going to outweigh your, your good works, not going to outweigh your bad works, etc. In other words, the determination as to where you're going uh, is, occurs after you die. And therefore, you spend your whole life working, not quite knowing where you're going, hoping you're going to the right place, and you're not going to end up there. And what Jesus is saying is this, believe, not work. Believe on me. Do it now, and you will have eternal life now. That's what's being said here. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, he is the one who has everlasting life. Life that doesn't end. Now someone will say, well, yeah, but he's going to die. Yes, he's going to die physically, but he will not die spiritually. He will continue to live on. In other words, when death comes to a believer, when physical death comes to the believer, it's just like a moving residence. He's just moving someplace else to live. That's all it is. It's not a cessation of consciousness. He just continues living and he just moves on into heaven. And his body remains here. And then you have the, the great statement saying, I am the bread of life. Now let's stop for a moment because he's going to be talking about eating that bread of life. I like bread. My wife likes bread. We all like bread, and I think most people do. Uh, you buy a, a, a burger, you whatever, a, a great deal of your meal, etc., includes bread. It starts in the morning with toast, and it goes on. Now, what do you do with that bread? You eat it. You consume it. You take it in. What happens to that bread? That bread becomes part of you gives you energy, allows you to do things, allows you to perform. In other words, it maintains your life. Now, keep that concept in, in mind when Jesus Christ is talking about eating the bread of life. And you look, look at it in the very next verse. He says, Your fathers did eat manna in, in the wilderness and died. And they, they were, literally, if you go back, you will, they, they were comparing Jesus to Moses. And he said, Moses... They said, Moses gave us manna from heaven. And he's saying, no, no, Moses didn't. My father did. And therefore, he had just fed them 5,000, etc., and they wanted more. Because after all, God fed them for 40 years in the wilderness. And he's saying this, yeah, they ate that bread, and 40 years later, they were dead. In other words, they died. This is not the bread I'm talking about. So therefore, what you, what you want is you want the bread that you're going to eat. It's going to fill your stomach for the moment. And, we may, it may, and if I keep supplying it to you, you it would fill your stomach for, for your lifetime, but you eventually would be dead just like your father's. That's what he's saying. So this miraculous bread you'd like me to give you, your, your, your father's ate it and died. This is what he's saying to them. So you better start looking for, for something else. There's got to be something else with it. Did the manna give them eternal life? The answer is no, it didn't. Well, what will give you eternal life? Well, the only thing he's just said what will give you eternal life. What will give you eternal life is believing on him. Now you go further and it says this, This is the bread that cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat of it and not die. He says, the bread, and he's pointing to himself, the bread that, that I'm going to give you, you eat of that, you consume that, you take that in, and you will not die. You will never die. Now, he's not talking about never dying physically. He's talking about never dying spiritually. And you move, and you move on to verse 51. It says this, I am the bread of life that, that came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Of, uh, of the, the world. The verbs have changed. Did you notice he began? I came down from heaven. It's past tense. See it? I came down from heaven. And if any man eat, that's present tense, of the bread, he shall live forever. 
and the bread that I will give, that's future, is my flesh. Now all of a sudden, we went from the bread of life to flesh. Now what is he talking about here? Well, I'm going to encapsulate it. The bread that he's talking about is himself. If we eat or take Jesus Christ in, like the bread, the bread becomes part of us. God becomes part of us. He, he comes in and lives in us and becomes part of us and he sustains our life. That's basically what he's saying. Now all of a sudden he's thrown in the flesh. Now you need to understand what that flesh is. Now we're going to do that in verse 53 and 54. He says, and the Jews therefore stroll among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? In other words, they're thinking cannibalism. They're thinking on a physical level. And Jesus says this, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now we're talking about eating the flesh, drinking the blood. Okay, let's stop for a moment. How did Jesus Christ come to to the, to the earth. He was born of a virgin. Am I correct? Therefore, my flesh is the incarnation. Now, notice in back in verse 51, and I will give my flesh, which, it, which I will give for the life of the world. Notice that's a future tense. So future to where God is, Jesus is speaking right now is the, is the crucifixion. Now notice that's like two pillars. That's like a parenthesis. You have the beginning of the ministry, which is the incarnation. I am the bread of life. I came down from heaven. I came as a human. And the blood I shed will be my blood. In other words, the one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood. The one who consumes both aspects of what Jesus Christ came. He came as a man and he died for the, to pay the sins of the world. And that's his blood. That he shed and he's talking about his entire ministry if you are <clears throat> if you want to believe Jesus then you have to believe both I've heard people say things like like uh, well yes Jesus was a good man he was a great teacher but he wasn't God you know what they just done they just destroyed the first part they just destroyed the, the flesh part they just destroyed the incarnation and then you say, well, <clears throat> others will say, yes, Jesus Christ died on the cross. But he only opened a door. That was only a door for us to do the rest. And I will tell you this, that is not what he, what he did. He didn't do a door for us, didn't die on the cross, to, to open a door so that we could do the rest. When he died on the cross, he paid for all of your sins. For the sins of the world were totally paid for. So therefore, the sins you committed last week, the sins you commit right now, the sins you're going to commit in the future, are all paid for. Which tells you that you do not go to hell because you do bad things. You go to hell because you don't believe. You don't eat the flesh and you don't drink the blood. You don't believe in the incarnation and you don't believe properly about the crucifixion. That is why you go to hell. To hell. It has nothing to do with what you do or what you don't do. And no matter how heinous the person and the individual is, belief is the only ticket and the only thing you need to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And, and this is what the, the, the gospel is telling you. He says this in verse 54, And he who, who eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath, present tense, eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. And that will raise him up is future tense. And it is future to what Jesus is saying. And therefore there is a last day coming. And this is what he's talking about. And there, in other words, if, if you are going to properly uh, understand what Jesus Christ and, and who Jesus Christ, what he did and who he is, you have to understand the incarnation. That will tell you who he is. He is God come down from heaven and come into human flesh. Or come not into, I'm sorry, that would be wrong. He came as human flesh. And then in the crucifixion you see what he has done. 
He has done the only thing that the one thing mankind cannot do, and that is pay for his own sins, and that is satisfy God the Father with a sacrifice. If, if, if you look at everything from God's perspective, as a God of the universe, God who created this massive universe, created this whole thing, and you say, what would it take to satisfy you? Could we take the best human being and sacrifice him? Would that please you? And the answer is no, because the best human being is imperfect. Then what would it take? It would take the, the it would take the highest and most perfect sacrifice, and therefore the only thing that it, that it could be is God himself. He would be the highest thing in the universe to be offered as, 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 as a sin's payment, and therefore this would satisfy him. And then he says in verse 55, he says this, For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He says, in other words, this is a real thing. This is a real McCoy. This is the attaining of eternal life. Take in the Jesus Christ. Take in the crucifixion. Take in the incarnation. Take in who he is. Take in what he's done. Accept it. Thank him for it. And move on. He says, He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. And as, as a living father has sent me I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. In other words, the eternal life is by Jesus Christ. I have eternal life by the authority of God and by the fact that he lives in me because I believe. And he says in verse 58, uh, This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat, and, and eat the manna. He says it's not the same as the manna. Your fathers ate that and died and are dead, he that eateth this bread shall live forever. In other words, he that takes in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Jesus himself, as God, and takes in what he has done, the crucifixion, and accepts that payment for his sins, the person who's done that, that person will be raised up and will be given an eternal life. It's not a future thing, it is a present, present thing, it's present to him accepting it. So I ask all of you, uh, if you have not done this sort of thing, uh, it's free. It doesn't cost you a thing. All you have to do is, is, is do it. it take, believe that Jesus Christ came as, as, as God came as man and, and believe that he died to pay for, for the sins of the In other words, that the entire life of Christ is what will give you, believing in the entire life of Christ will give you eternal life. Then he says in verse 59, he says this, these things said he in the synagogues as he's taught in Capernaum. In other words, he was right where the religion, the heart of the religion was. And he was teaching these people how they could have eternal life. And they thought that by doing all the things they were doing, they were attaining eternal life. And they weren't. And you will notice it says in verse 16, Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? In other words, who can understand it? And uh, we will talk about that, who can understand it, and what God's role is in helping man understand it next time. So until next week, I bid you Godspeed from on Victory's side. We'll see you next week.